You know the definition of an optimist is a person who plays a trumpet and carries a pager. Uh, it'll take a moment for you to... Just a joke, Bill. It's just a joke. Having a little fun with you. I remember one cold uh, winter morning back when Dr. Walford was president and we had, uh, we had a few Saturday morning classes and one of my Saturday morning classes was taught by um, uh, S. Lewis Johnson. Dr. S. Lewis Johnson now gone and, and uh, taught a lot of us on the platform uh, Greek and, and uh, for some of us it was more of a challenge for him than for others. And uh, I happened to be walking along as he was making his way uh, to the class. He hated cold weather, had a big, heavy black coat on, a hat on, and, and he's from the Carolinas. And so this kind of cold weather for him was unusual. And he said, uh, I said, good morning, Doc Johnson. He said, uh, mm. I said, um, how are you? Uh, uh, not well. You know the problem with this school, Chuck? I said, uh, no, sir run by a bunch of Yankees. <laughs> bunch of Yankees have class on days this cold. I'm so excited about this new year, I can hardly stand it. I, I have to tell you. It's always amazing to me that people are bored. There are folks that are actually bored in life, like a fellow named Lawrence Walters from San Pedro, California. Uh, let me tell you about Lawrence. He said one day, enough is enough. What I need is a little adventure. Tired of just sitting around. So on the 2nd of July that year, he rigged up 42 helium-filled weather balloons, tied them to a Sears lawn chair, and lifted off. <laughs> True story. Armed with only a pellet gun. To help handle the elevation issues. Before he knew it, he was shocked to realize he was 16,000 feet high. Walters sort of had his breath taken away about that level. Mine started getting a little fuzzy. He wasn't the only one surprised. Pilot in a Southwest airline. <laughs> radioed the tower and said, some guy is in a lawn chair <laughs> floating across the sky. <laughs> Thankfully, Walters had enough presence of mind to start shooting out the balloons, which allowed him to land uh, about 45 minutes later in Long Beach. But that bizarre experience got him on a Tonight Show and a Timex watch and a Timex ad and ultimately the guy had to quit his job as he went on the road to deliver motivational speeches. <laughs> that is how hard up we are for motivational speakers. So why in the world did you do that? Was the common question everybody asked him. He says, uh, people ask me that a lot. They want to know if I had a, like a death wish or something. And he said, I, I just told him, no, I just had to do something. I couldn't just keep sitting there. The guy's a nut. <laughs> you imagine people just sitting there. You can't and I can't. What a terrible way to spend a year just sitting around, just wondering and waiting for something to happen with years unfolding like these years, the best years of our lives and the best is yet to come. We just sang about it. Now, how exciting is it that we can, we can walk into 12 new months? Well, the half of it's already gone. So 11 and a half of the months now that are unrolling in front of us, which I want to talk to you about. And, um, I want to warn you, too, before we get into these months very far, that, that there are dangers lurking. Uh, a couple of three of them that came to my mind as I put my thoughts together. There's the danger of our walking in the flesh instead of the spirit and uh, uh, suffering the consequences, not walking by faith, but 
walking by sight, which fills our lives with worry, stupid worries. Then there's a danger of uh, planning every detail right down to the gnat's whisker and forgetting the most important part of all, and that's praying for direction as we walk into these 11 and a half months that remain. And the the danger of running ahead of God rather than waiting for him to open doors and to make the path straight and to clear the obstacles instead of our trying to move them out of the way ourselves. And that constant battle everybody has with worry. Chances are good your worry list is longer than your prayer list. You're all worried about some big thing on the horizon. And and it's a very real uh, probability it'll never happen. My worst worries and fears never realized throughout my life. And, of course, the greatest of all the worries is the worry regarding uh, when our last day will come. And that's a serious issue. Of course it is. Peter Marshall, while he was chaplain of the Senate during the days of the Second World War, um, loved to tell the story. It was an old legend of a merchant in Baghdad who one day sent his servant to the market. And before very long, the servant came back white and trembling and He said to his master, down at the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd. And when she turned and looked at me, I looked right in the face of death. Death jostled me. She made a threatening gesture. And he said, master, please lend me your horse. I must must hasten to avoid her. And I will ride to Samara and there... Uh, Death will not find me. Of course, the master lent him his horse and he galloped away. And that afternoon, the same master made his way into the market, ran into the same old woman, walked up to her and said, why did you frighten my servant this morning? Uh, Why did you make that threatening gesture? Her response was, that was not a threatening gesture. Death said, it was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him here in Baghdad. You see, I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. (laughs) We serve a God who has put our lives together start to finish. He's not finding things out along the way. Uh, You'll never hear a gasp coming from heaven. Wow, I didn't know that. It's planned for us. Our times are in his hands. And some of you are learning that better than others. I have a few timely reminders for you in taking on the new year. They're all based on three simple statements found in James chapter 4. If you brought a testament with you, turn to it as Dr. Trunsaint turns to his Greek text to check it out. Good for him. He's in our church. I look at him every Sunday and I thank God for things like patience on his part and a willingness to listen to me who was once his student. Talk about an amazing turn of events. Remarkable, even shows up. So here we are looking at the next few months and we read in verse 13 of James 4. Come on now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and we'll spend a year there and And engage in business and make a profit. Yet, look closely, students, faculty members, 
friends of the seminary, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. And then we will do this or that. Love this passage of scripture. Love it. Preach on it every new year. Whoever's from Stonebriar Church, you heard me bring his talk a few Sundays ago. It's a great reminder, not just at the beginning of a new year, but how easy it is to play God, especially when we get a little theology under our belt. <laughs> it's easy to think uh, we got him figured out. I remember when Donald Gray Barnhouse up in, Pennsylvania, up, up in Philadelphia used to stand before a simple microphone, a Bible in his hand, and he'd take, he'd take questions from the audience, called it Open Forum. And his, his student up in the balcony stood up and said, Dr. Barnhouse, I've been wondering, how could the children of Israel be 40 years in the wilderness and the shoes never wear out and the clothes never wear out and they never went hungry? Dr. Barnhouse's answer was, God! He kind of had the voice of the fourth member of the Trinity, you know. <laughs> God! The kid goes, oh, now I understand. <laughs> Barnhouse said, no, you don't, son. Nobody understands. Isn't that great? Nobody understands. We got an old year that's passed. We got a new year coming. And if we're not careful... We'll follow our own rules. Look at verse 13. Here are our rules, our rules. First, we choose our time today or tomorrow. See, we're making plans. We got our day timer or whatever form you use to help organize your life. So we choose our own time today or tomorrow. Second, we select our location. We we'll go to such and such a city. January, I'm going to be in Dallas. Come July, I'm going to be in Phoenix. Uh, come September, hope to be, and you name that. We, we, we choose the location. We select the, the place we're going to be. Third, we limit our stay. See what it says? We'll spend a year there. So this guy's really got his life organized. And then we arrange our activities. We will engage in business. We even predict a profit. We will make a profit. It's all in verse 13. That's exactly what we do in unguarded moments. I do it when I'm not thinking more wisely. I set out a plan. I got the year in front of me. I love getting my book and going through January and February and March. I get all this thing. I've done all, all the way through December as if I'm going to live to see December. I don't know. I will. Got it all planned out. Now, understand, James is not criticizing good planning. It, he's, he's not advocating being haphazard about uh, our lives, being disorganized. <laughs> Book of Proverbs, which I'm reading with our, one of our grandsons. Every day we're going through a, a, a chapter in the Proverbs. We're going to do it all year long. <laughs> Here I go again. Maybe we're going to go through it all year long. <laughs> if, if I'm still around, if, if he's still around, what a thought. But or, Proverbs is talking about organizing your life. He, what he's addressing is demonstrating mistaken confidence. Stop that. Stop that kind of, uh, of presumptive living, presumptuous living. In fact, look at the very next verse. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Isn't that a remarkable thought? We, we planned out tomorrow, but we don't know what our life will be like tomorrow. I put together a few tomorrows. It's a Thursday. The date is April the 13th. 
The Secretary of War is Edwin Stanton. He's making plans in the White House for a celebration. Flowers have been ordered. Banners have been raised. The name, Ulysses S. Grant, Victor, is going to be spread all over. The war, this terrible war between the states, finally the bloodshed is ending. They're going to celebrate. And then in the words of Jay Winnick, then came the bullet that bore into his brain, 1865, April 14th, Good Friday, the president's assassinated. The day before, they didn't know a thing about that. Oh, they got the security all buttoned down. President's okay, safe. Thank God the newspapers are finally getting beyond the ugly criticism of this buffoon of an ape-like president, they called him. Now he's dead. Travel with me ahead uh, over 75 years later. It's a Saturday afternoon and a naval officer and his wife are, of all things, finishing the decorating of their little apartment as they're enjoying uh, that wonderful tour duty at Pearl Harbor. December 6th, we'll sleep in tomorrow morning. Got our apartment ready. This is going to be great. Wonderful night of romance together. And boom, the place comes apart the next day. Tomorrow, December 7, 1941, Sunday morning, when all hell broke loose. I never thought of that the day before. He didn't know what their life would be like tomorrow. You and I were not alive in that first tomorrow. Many of you weren't alive in the second I mentioned. Let me mention one where we all were. Monday night football. What a great game it was. <laughs> had a terrific time. The guys on the TV talked too much, so I had it on mute. <laughs> Just enjoyed the game, Cynthia and I and two or three friends we had over in our little, our little home here in Dallas. September. 10, 2001. And I'm eating a bowl of cereal on Tuesday morning in the kitchen, standing up, which is my style when I have breakfast. Not that I'm driven, but. <laughs> and I click on the TV, it's still on mute. And I'm looking at what looks like a Bruce Willis movie. And I'm thinking, how in the world did they film that? I got a son at. Uh, School of the Recording Arts down in Florida where they do these uh, animations. And, and I'm thinking, well, he would know how they did that film. And all of a sudden, boom, a plane goes through the second tower. And I scream for Cynthia. And we call our kids. We couldn't get through to one of them. And Cypher Living was at that time in a place called EDS in temporary quarters as our building was being built. And boy, that place shut down. It looked like we were at war. We were. Tomorrow. <sighs> Isn't that amazing? I mentioned a Thursday in a week. I, I, I mentioned a, a, a Saturday afternoon and in an otherwise delightful week. I mentioned a, 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 a Monday where, by the way, I read later Twelve investors had met on the 101st floor saying, tomorrow morning we meet and carry out this plan. Come early. And they did. And they never got out of the South Tower. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Nor do I. Suddenly it, 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 it makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, James, writing way ahead of his time. Wow.
Why, you're just a vapor. You're just a vapor. Shakespeare writes in Hamlet, uh, Macbeth, he writes, if you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me. No wonder there's such a run on astrologists. Stupid game plan in life. Guide your life by the stars. They don't know either. But we long to know people who know tomorrow. I got a friend who lives in Santa Barbara Canyon. He said, Chuck, when the fire hit, it came like like a 50 mile an hour flood of flames. He says, I looked up and I saw the smoke and I started making a list. I called my dog over and I got my dog next to me and I'm putting my list together. And I got out of there with a car, a dog and my list. I lost everything else. You don't know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. So, what do we do? Uh, Let me give you some things to write down. I've said one of them over and over again, so you hopefully have put that down. You have no knowledge of what tomorrow holds. We have a church out in Frisco filled with people who didn't know what their year held. Before the year started, they didn't know that by the end of the year, they'd be unemployed. Whole bunch of white collar workers unemployed now. Not just white collar workers. One lady didn't know she'd face serious surgery. When they cut her open, they just sewed her back up. It's inoperable. Healthy looking, attractive, a young grandmother. One family didn't know they'd lose the man of the house. 50-year-old pilot with Delta. Layover in Amsterdam. He and his co-pilot friend, flown together for years, went to school together. Decided on their layover, because you have to lay over to get your sleep back so you feel okay to fly back across the pond. And while they're in Amsterdam, this pilot friend of mine and, and the co-pilot says, he says to, they say to each other, let's go bike riding. Boom, hit by a bullet train, gone. Could hardly find the remains. The family didn't know they'd be without a man of the house. This isn't dramatic stuff that we made a movie out of. This is real stuff. I can give you names to every one of these people. It goes on. There was a family that discovered their 15-year-old son is now on drugs. At the top of his class. Got a drug problem he's kept secret for two years. He also been messing around with pornography. All that's come to light. Now the other side is that we have a couple that thought they'd be single forever and they've fallen in love with each other and they can hardly wait to get married in April. They didn't even know each other at the beginning of last year. How exciting is that? I got a pastor friend who was at Schofield Memorial Church and he's now in Fargo, North Dakota. Ah! <laughs> and I'm driving along in my truck yesterday and I hear in Fargo it's 37 below zero. I prayed for Matthew St. John. We have friends from that church, or his friends that are from that church that were visiting our church a few Sundays ago and they took my hand like they were about to pass out and they said, pray for our new pastor. He has no idea what winter is like. (laughs) We shut down schools when it gets to 20 in Dallas. 37 below zero. I could go on. You do not know. How about finances? How about finances? I would like to announce today that we're going to take that 200,000 surplus and give it to all the students. I would like to announce that. We're not going to do that, but I would like to announce that today. Yancey wrote this on the last page of the January 09 issue. Listen to this. 
As analysts began picking through the ruins of the financial collapse, they started dusting off old-fashioned words like greed, moderation, integrity, and trust. When executives line their pockets at the expense of employees and shareholders, when banks make speculative loans with little likelihood of payback, when borrowers walk away with good faith contract from good faith contracts and the system breaks, the system collapses. A functioning economy is held together by a thin web of trust. If you doubt that, visit a country where you have to pay bribes to get action and you must count your change after every purchase. Then this. The same week that global wealth shrank by $7 trillion, Zimbabwe's inflation rate hit a record 231 million percent. In other words, if you had saved $1 million Zimbabwean dollars on Monday, by Tuesday it's worth $1.58. You have no knowledge of what tomorrow will bring. Second, you have no assurance of a long life. I preached this many times before I ever let the text say what it's saying. And I found that pauses are worth more than words. You are just a vapor, appears for a little while, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live. Pause. And if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. You have no assurance of a long life. You see the word he uses to describe our lives? Vapor. Atmis, A-T-M-I-S in the Greek. We get our word atmosphere from it. Puff of smoke is the way one renders it. Another, a wisp of fog. All these hot shots running around three-piece suits looking like big deals. Driven around in limousines. Think they got life with the tail. Their life is like a wisp of fog. I bury him earlier, younger now than ever in my ministry. I should have kept a record of the 40 and 50 year olds I've buried in the last two years. It's remarkable. So we have no assurance of a long life. So here's what we ought to say. If the Lord wills, not about my will, it's about his will. Not about the attorney who draws up a will for my life. It's about the Lord's will. If the Lord wills, we will live, meaning I don't have forever. And then we will do this or that. Three very practical, very practical lessons, and I'm through. Number one, there is a will we need to respect. Our Lord's will. Notice the name, Lord. I don't need to remind you of all that that includes. Our master. There is a will we need to respect. This, by the way, will guard us from um, pride. Constant problem we all fight, pride. If the Lord wills. Second, there is a destiny we need to remember. This will guard you from presumption. I say work hard. I say give it your best. These are the only few years you'll be at this place. Give it everything you've got. Grades will take care of themselves. Give it everything you've got. Because there's a destiny you need to remember. We're all going to wind up there. And it doesn't mean you run scared, okay? I was in the grocery store the other day. A very old lady was shopping next to me. And I listened to her. She kind of talking to herself. Or she had one of those ear deals and was talking to somebody. I've answered people in grocery stores. I reached over to get tomatoes one time and she said, no, I've got... 
but she wasn't talking to me. She's talking to Frank somewhere on the phone. Anyway, this old lady talking to herself, picking among the bananas. No green ones. Don't want to get any green ones. She wouldn't even buy green bananas. Don't, don't live like that. You know, you're going you're gonna to probably make it to tomorrow. You, So there's a destiny we just, we just need to be remembering. But here's the third and the last. There's a life we need to realize. And this will guard you from procrastination. For goodness sake, live. I love Jim Elliott's line, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Live it. Don't put it off. Live it. It's a wonderful way to conduct your life. And so much more to do than helium balloons on a lawn chair. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't, you'll regret it. My brother-in-law opened the bottom drawer of my sister's bureau and lifted out a tissue-wrapped package. This, he said to me, this is not a slip. This is lingerie. He discarded the tissue and handed me the slip. It was exquisite silk, handmade, trimmed with a cobweb of lace. The price tag with an astronomical figure still on it, still attached. Jan uh, bought this the first time we went to New York at least eight or nine years ago, but she never wore it. She was saving it for a special occasion. Well, I guess this is the occasion. He took the lovely slip from me and put it on the bed with the other clothes we were taking to the mortician. His hands lingered on the soft material for a moment, then he slammed the drawer shut. Stood there and then said, don't ever save anything for a special occasion. Every day you're alive is a special occasion. I remembered those words through the funeral and the days that followed when I helped him and my niece attend to the, all the sad chores that followed an unexpected death. I thought about them on the plane ride returning home from the Midwestern town where my sister's family still lives. I thought about all the things she hadn't seen or heard or done. Thought about the things that that she had done without realizing they were all special. I'm still thinking about his words to me, and they've changed my life. I'm not, uh, I'm not saving anything now. We use our good china and crystal for every special event, such as losing a pound, <laughs> getting a sink unstopped, The first camellia blossom in spring. Someday, and one of these days are losing their grip on my vocabulary. If it's worth seeing or hearing or doing, I want to see and hear and do it now. Now. I'm trying very hard not to put off, hold back, or save anything that would add laughter and luster to my and our lives. And every morning when I open my eyes, I tell myself, this is a special day. Father, thank you for perspective that only you give at times like this. 
you have an amazing way of never decreasing our joy, but reminding us of the brevity of life and the necessity of living it. Thank you for the warnings against pride and presumption, against procrastination. Help me to live this better than I could ever preach it. Thank you for the year. By your grace, we'll live it. And if it's in your will, we'll see the end of it. Thank you that it's well with our souls because of Christ.